building positions. I mean, that's okay. what the sport's all about. Just don't don't go fast. Don't try and you know get all your shots off in the set amount of time. It's important to build solid positions and get hits. All right, everybody. At this point in time, it's uh, it's time that we should start sending some rounds down range. Actually, and and at I, we're not going to talk about it in future tense or whatever tense. We've already sent rounds down range, Mark. Uh, it, it happened, Jim. <laughs> it, it happened, and there's nothing we can do about it at this point. Yeah, and honestly, however, we it's just it is what it is. Uh, but sitting across the table from us is Dave Preston. And uh, Dave was out there with us at the range today because he is a PRS competitor and does the uh, does PRS at quite a high level. You've been doing it for a while now, from what I've gathered. Um, you do a whole lot of other stuff too. You're a machinist, and uh, I shouldn't do the whole intro on you. Should let you do that yourself. But um, yeah, give people an idea of who you are, and then we'll we'll dive right in. Yeah. So I uh, started shooting competitively in 2010. Uh, you know, backwoods sniper competitions, nothing formal. I mean, um, first PRS actual match was in 2013. Uh, so I guess I've been doing it like eight years now. Mm-hmm. But um, I don't know, in 2015, I won the PRS finale, uh, the match and the season. Um, and there's been a few different, you know, third places in there. And I think this past year, you know, two kids and uh, another one on the way is starting Ooh. to affect my shooting. So uh, <laughs> I took seventh place in the series this year. So pretty damn still, good. Yeah, I'd say that's still pretty solid. And though. on the side, I got a machine shop, gray op CNC, uh, mm-hmm. rifle accessories. So I stay busy. Yeah. Yeah. You're machining up all kinds of parts to keep plastering on your rifle to yep. make it like 40 pounds. Right? <laughs> <laughs> More weight is better for recoil. So. This is this is true. This is what I've gathered, and actually, for the first time ever, I'm starting to see why Scott Parks uh, abhors the six five Creedmoor for just its intense recoil. Oh, it's awful! <laughs> oh my gosh, it's just so much. Beats you up, um, oh, particularly in these, with these flyweight rifles we have. Apparently, uh, yeah, I know, right? What do our rifles weigh? Like 12, 13 pounds? They might as well be like <laughs> ultra light. Yeah. Um, but uh, anyway, so we went through some various different uh, courses of fire. Dave uh, joined us at the range, and he helped us out by setting up some different uh, scenarios. And But now we want to ask you some questions. We'll get into a little bit of that, too. You can also check it out on the, on the video portion of this pod venture. Um, but Dave, I mean, talking to somebody about, like, maybe they've gone through, they've done all their research, they've figured out what gear they're doing, and they know what type of competition they want to pursue. And in this case, we're going to be doing this PRS match, so we'll assume it's that. Um, but they haven't actually gone to one before, so they haven't actually put themselves in that situation mm-hmm. of being in the match environment, having to do things on the clock, uh, where it's not just necessarily like, if you mess up, it's kind of, oh, bummer, I'll do it again. It's, it's no, that was the stage. Yeah. Um, what uh, what should somebody be doing in order to prepare for their first PRS style match? So it's always good to you know see other people do it. You know, like you said, pictures worth a thousand words. But uh, there's tons of content online. You know, you can follow some of the you know you can look at the leaderboards on PRS or NRL and follow them on Instagram, Facebook. They've got videos up there. You can kind of see how they shoot stages, see what some of the stages are like, um, and. Once you've got an idea on that, I mean, you can just practice a little bit at home. It doesn't have to be actual live fire. You can do dry firing. Um, uh, target acquisition is a, a big thing. You know, just finding the target and coming into your scope and being able to have have the uh, target right there. So, mm-hmm. is and on top of that, I mean, shooting's just part of it. You know, there's you've got lots of things going on whenever that buzzer beeps, and you got to be able to handle it all. So, just being prepared that way mentally. Yeah. I think w- one thing that really stood out to me was just even kind of the um, some of the protocols that go along with with this style of match. Like you know, I predominantly the hunting based background, right? Where it's like you know, if you if you need a second shot, I mean, you're just cycling that bolt and getting after it, right? Where this, it's definitely more methodical, and you know, you don't move unless your bolt is open you don't chamber around unless you're on the target um definitely some stuff there to keep in mind and like you said safe safety stuff and uh stuff that maybe doesn't necessarily translate over you know into like 
it doesn't it doesn't i guess it's different it's different yeah. than you know a lot of hunting scenarios that i've been it's in. like it's like a street fight versus a sanctioned boxing match yes <laughs> like in the end you're still you know you're still fighting but there's there's a lot more rules around the other one and there's there's ways to be better and and utilize those rules to I mean, all kinds of stuff yeah so I'd, I'd say that's definitely something that stood out to me like if you're going to one of these matches that we haven't even gone to the match part yet right but um probably go to a match and like you said see some of that stuff yeah. or watch yeah. the videos or kind of figure out kind of the the lay of the land and those things that you have to do. Yeah, I mean, that that I could mean, be like a DQ, you know? Like you, Yeah, there's definitely a procedure. I mean, when you get that many people in one area with, you know, rifles, you just can't have people, oh, that might be loaded, that might not. Be. No, there's like set rules. Yeah. Yes. Um, load when you're told to load, you know, muzzle awareness. Your muzzle has to be pointed in a certain direction at all times, you know, just there's a way to do things. And uh, they go through all that stuff in like the pre-match brief, mm -hmm. you know, and if you have questions, just ask. I mean, lots of people to help, but mm -hmm. yeah. It is nice to get that ahead of time, though, because if you're trying to get everything, like I always see, because um, I've done a couple of three-gun matches now, I always see kind of the, the pre-match brief as sort of a handy reminder. But if it's the mm -hmm. first time you're hearing all the rules, it's it's got to be, I mean, I can only imagine it's got to be overwhelming, you know, and, and you're trying to, okay, he just said this, and he just said that. Did I just miss the one thing because I was trying to write down a note over here? It's, it's, if you can go through those rules in advance, mm -hmm. I feel like it would be really uh, it'd be really nice. And even being able to talk with somebody like you, or <clears throat> I know we've talked with Nick a little bit uh, about navigating, you know, stepping up to a stage, getting ready to go on the stage, and something as simple as when the RO comes back and he's just kind of like, well, you know, are you ready? Before you just instinctively say, yeah. Right. Like, make sure you're actually ready. Because otherwise, mm -hmm. if you say, yeah, and you're not ready, he's like, okay, all right, let's go. <laughs> and you're all of a sudden like, oh, wait, but I didn't dial my turret, or I didn't make sure my parallax is right, or I'm on the wrong magnification, my mag's not. Uh, it's, I mean, you're, you're just setting yourself up for a mess. Yeah, there's, there's kind of a, I was talking to you earlier at the range, but there's a procedure I go through, and it all comes down to, I mean, do everything you possibly can to be ready for the stage when he asks you. And that's just checking your data, making sure you got the right data card in, you know, it wasn't left over from the previous stage, just taking yeah. care of everything you can take care of. But yeah. Talk more on the, the idea too, of you kind of got at it there. Consistency. How important is it to you to do the same thing every time consistency wise? Uh, it's super important. You've got a lot of, it's kind of just that repetitious, uh, when you do something so many times, you get really good at it, and you do the same thing every single time. Um, let me think here. So before the stage, you know, I go through the same checklist every single time. And every stage is basically the same, so you can do the same procedure every single stage. Mm -hmm. It just helps eliminate uh, any mental errors because when you get to a certain level in this sport, everybody is really, really good. And... It's those one or two little mental slip-ups that separate, you know, winning versus 10th place. Yeah. So it's by having those systems in place, you eliminate all that. And, you know, it's it's really beneficial for new shooters, too. Mm -hmm. but. And thinking on things in advance, again, I feel like that's kind of a really common theme. But thinking on things in advance, for example, when you were walking us through the PRS barricade, I know the first time Mark and I tried to tackle that thing... It was a mess of how am I, like, is this comfortable? No. Is this comfortable? No. Am I steady here? No. I'm wobbling all over the place. And we're up there at the barricade the whole time that we're on the clock. Nick was timing us and trying to run us through a couple of different stage-style mm -hmm. things. The whole time we're on the clock, we're moving around. And it's because, I know for me at least, I looked at the barricade and I'm like, okay, all I got to do is go up there and shoot off that thing, shoot off that thing, shoot off that thing. Yeah, whatever. All right, cool. Let's go. But I didn't actually think about, well, how am I going to get behind that? And and uh, the mental preparation for just even how you're going to move. Well, yeah, and then you, you might get down on it. You go, well, this isn't steady. And then you try this. Well, this is that's a little better. Oh, try that, try that. It you all know, comes down to practice. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you're going to have to start somewhere. You might as well just start like you guys did. And before long, you're going to look at something and be like, yep, I can do that there. I can do that there. My mm -hmm. bipods need to be three clicks out for that position. And yeah. you'll just know all this stuff ahead of time by looking at it. But That's yeah. why I feel like you uh, precision shooter guys, the, the competition guys, 
they're always kind of looking at different things and, and wondering before you even think about like, well, what am I going to dial? What am I going to whatever? How am I going to break this shot? It's like, well, how am I going to get behind my rifle there? Mm-hmm. And, uh, that's but it's it's precision. You only get you know so many rounds. It's not oh well, I missed. I'll get a second try. Well, mm-hmm. You don't sometimes. So yeah, I think every I, shot counts. I think uh, you know learning how to read those stages and the different scenarios is probably probably the hardest part. Mm-hmm. Really, I mean yeah. you know I mean, you definitely have to have good fundamentals and be able to shoot your rifle and have a good rifle that's accurate and and those things. But reading that stage and like getting those details to set up properly in the most stable position fast, like mm-hmm. the first time, that's that's the tough part. Yeah, sometimes hitting the target's the easy part. It's just <laughs> there's a sequence that things have to go in, and if you're out of sequence or you shoot the wrong target, I mean, that's just a, a mental mistake that you weren't ready for. Yeah, I mean, I noticed that today. There was, <clears throat> I'd set up on something like, no, I don't like that. And then I'd do it a different one. I'm like, oh, dude, it's like night and day. Or Dave, you give me some tips. I'm like, oh, that's way better. But you know, you're figuring that out on the clock, right? Mm-hmm. You know, right. How about the uh, efficiently moving? So when we were going from different positions, uh, you know, the PRS barricade is a is a great example of that, where you're down low, you're moving up high, but it's kind of at this middle awkward mm-hmm. height that's not perfectly standing, and then you're moving across and back down to kneeling. Um, you know, somebody who just starts, I feel like they kind of tackle that, and they're they're stepping all over and they're moving all over. Whereas you, when we watched you do it, I mean, it was like, I think you maybe took five steps between all the different things in total. And it was mm-hmm. just boom, 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 boom. Really smooth looking. Uh, the the level of efficiency of those movements was well, it's, like it's pretty more of a It's more of an advanced thing, I would think. I mean, you're not going to practice your footwork before you can hit a target. You're going to, that's more of a, you know, all right, I can do this. All right, well, let's see how fast I can do it. Sure. Let's see how efficient I can do it. Because with the PRS barricade, if you get eight hits in 50 seconds, well, somebody else just did it in 45. Okay, so how can I get to 40? And then it's just a constant battle of how can I do this faster, faster, faster. And the only way to do that is just to get as efficient with that stage as humanly possible. And, you know, it all comes down to in between the shots. Yeah getting comfortable, getting steady as fast as you can. and So like you said, maybe like talking about just how absolutely efficient you can get with your motion stuff, maybe that's a little bit more of an advanced thing. Mm-hmm. It, where do you feel somebody who's just starting out in PRS, like where do you feel most of their focus should be? Is it on being able to hit targets? Is it on being able to just not get DQ'd, is it? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously, safety's number one. Yep. But uh, I would say building positions, I mean, that's okay. what the sport's all about. Just don't don't go fast. Don't try and, you know, get all your shots off in the set amount of time. It's important to build solid positions and get hits. You know, if you only get five out of the, uh, out of the ten shots off, that's fine. But... The more you do it, the faster you're going to get, the more comfortable. At this point, I don't even think about dropping into a kneeling position or a standing position. It's just like muscle memory. So build solid fundamentals, and the more you do it, it becomes muscle memory, and you're going to get faster at that point. So, mm-hmm. how, do you, uh, how do you practice that? I don't like to dry fire a lot. Uh, well, it also helps that I have a range right out my back door. Yeah, that, but that dry firing is fine. Um, I like... <clears throat> 400 yards, uh, an eight inch target. So it's two MOA and I'll just pick whatever positions I can think of. I'll do, uh, you know, 10 positions, one target, and then I'll do five positions, double tapping each target. Kind of just like start off basic what I did with you guys at the range and each stage you get progressively harder to where you're doing two targets and now maybe you're doing three different targets and holding and dialing and um, you can make it as complicated as you want. But I think uh, just work on, you know, 10 different positions at different heights at the same target. And if you practice that over and over, that's going to be, you know, a good fundamental to start with. Yeah. It's kind of like uh, it's kind of like shooting hoops in your driveway a little bit. Like after a while, you can only just sort of like shoot a regular shot so many times you're like well let's try and make it more game like or something or let's try mm-hmm. and throw a little twist in there like playing horse or something <laughs> something real extreme yeah <laughs> well 
We didn't get the left-handed, but uh. you might see it someday. Well, like you, what, like yeah. like you said, safety is paramount. So <laughs> I don't I don't think we need to be shooting left handed. <laughs> <laughs> it says the guy who took the off hand eight hundred shot, eight hundred yard shot. Hey, Just he almost a, hit that very narrow close. miss, yeah. narrow miss. Yeah, very close. I want another crack at it, Jim. Um, should somebody practice shooting? Uh, wrong hand, so to speak, or weak side hand. I mean, like I that's said, more of those one of those advanced things, right? Kind of advanced, yeah. There's more important things to to practice first, but when you've mm-hmm. mastered those, okay, now go with a little bit of lefty or weak side. Yeah, I'm nervous that that's going to come up at our match. I'm just going to shoot it strong side. <laughs> <laughs> you better get a DQ. I'll tell him I'm ambidextrous, and I just am choosing this side. I think if you were ambidextrous, that would be all the more reason for you to shoot the left-handed part. God, you're poking holes in my. <laughs> Damn it, Jim. That's all right. Mark uh, didn't sleep last night. You just got back from Alaska. Yeah, I'm, I'm giving really... you an out. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, the the uh, the the synapse are uh, not quite firing on all cinder cylinders. S- cin- all cinders. <laughs> all cinders. Yeah. <laughs> Roll, rolled rolled into the house at 4 a.m. Then the girls got up, and so then they were excited that Dad was home, which warmed my heart. But so they were up till about 5 a.m. And then I kind of slept and got up in six and met you guys and we shot firearms. Heck yeah. On that note, <laughs> uh, more on preparing for a match. So how much time do you actually spend just kind of posted up shooting, working on getting your data versus the positional building, that sort of thing? Mm, data. I like to do it once or twice, two different nights before a match. Okay. Um, you know, there's there's a ton of different things. You, light conditions, you know, wind. It could be a bad day for shooting where you're not getting, you know, accurate results. There could be mirage. So you try and do it in the first thing in the morning or uh, right before dark. But I don't know. I mean, make sure you got a good solid zero. Shoot some steel past 600 yards. You know, farther the better. Eight, 900 yards would be perfect. And then once you've got that data, you just kind of go with your ballistic solver or orchestral and make things match up. Yeah. You reload your own ammo. Yeah. And, you know, you've got this pretty sweet-looking precision rifle there. How paramount is it to you that you're just stacking them in there at 100 yards? Like, if you're shooting... If you're shooting sub half minute, are you like not good enough? It's got to be sub quarter. And then no, if you're shooting, it doesn't. <laughs> like at what point are you kind of like, yeah, that's good enough. I'm gonna go back to shooting positionally and challenging myself to that sort of thing. It used to be guys were like, oh, this gun has to one hole, or I'm not gonna be competitive. But no, you can be competitive if you're, you know, less than if you're around three quarters of an inch or less. I mean, okay. it, it, it all comes down. There's so much positional now, um, where your gun's gonna do fine. You know, it's it's all on you. Mm-hmm. How steady you get? Are you, you know, I didn't make any mistakes. A lot of the points that are missed come from guys shooting the wrong target, shooting things out of order, timing out. I mean, yeah, three quarter inch or less gun, you're going to be just fine. A lot of uh, mental side to the stages too. You know, like I mean, you got to even just the kind of the mock stages that that we did. You know, it's like, oh, they said you, you got this order or that order, or you're going to, you know, hold off your reticle for this one, but you're going to dial for this one. There's a lot to remember, you know, and then right. all of a sudden the buzzer beeps and there's even more pressure. And, uh, and yeah, and sometimes you're kind of looking at it and you stay the stage like the one that we did where we were at, uh, we were going back and forth from 800 to 300 to 800 to 300 off two different positions. And it was like, yeah, go back and forth five times. And I'm like, all right, it's easy. It's two things. Do it five times. And then I got to number four, and I'm like, uh, how many times did I do this? <laughs> like, and you were breathing hard by that point. <laughs> oh, yeah, totally. And, uh, you know, and I mean, another fun uh, fun thing that we ran into on that one, I know actually both Mark and I ran into, mm-hmm. was that, uh, Mark, I don't know about you, but I we have reticles for holding over on and all kinds of stuff. And I've used, like, BDC for holdovers. But actually, most of the time when I'm shooting, quote, precision, but it's just sort of at the range, shooting at long distances, hey, look, I can ring the steel out that far. And just dial. Yep. But then you told us a few times, it's like, no, you're going to hold over. You can't touch the adjustments on your scope. That might happen in a stage where the ROs say, 
set your adjustments. You can't touch them again throughout the stage. You got to hold. Or just because of time, you know, like, or well, if I'm going to execute all these shots, I'm going to need to hold versus dial. Realized I was super rusty at that and oh. uh, just didn't study the reticle enough to actually figure out how it all works. We were holding under when we were going from eight to three and uh, wound up botching a bunch of shots at three just because it was holding on the wrong spot on the reticle. Mm-hmm. I did the exact same thing. I think I, I think I was actually holding in the same spot on the reticle as you were. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, the hold under. Like, it's just, it's different. I wouldn't say I'm an expert at holdovers either, right? Because I, mean, I generally dial whenever I can as well. But just mentally, like, it looks different. It's like, wait, what am I? It's just, mm-hmm. it's just 100% different. How do you go about, uh, how about, first question I'll ask you regarding holdovers. How do you go about figuring out if a stage is one that you're going to dial or hold over on? I mean, there's a lot of different variables. Um, time constraints, how many times you have to dial. You know, am I able to double tap this target and move on? Or is it kind of like an out and back, out and back where I have to dial every single time? Um, yeah. you. The more you do it, you'll get to know, I have time for this or I don't have time for this. And target sizes also play a big role in that. If if they're decent sized targets, okay, I'll be fine with a holdover. Oh, right. Um, sure. But if you're shooting four inch targets at 400 and then a six inch at 600, yeah, holdover's not super, super accurate. I'd be yeah. better if I was dead center on the crosshairs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And your strategy, this is one of the things we talked about too with holdovers, because I, I asked the question, um, I'm used to hearing people talking about holding over in competition, and it never occurred to me, like, okay, you've got a shot at, say, even if it's just three, four, five, six or something, you're making this ladder out. I realized, well, wait, are you going to leave your turret on zero and hold over for all of them or dial to one of them and then hold over for the rest? And, you know, and, and, and if you're going to dial to one of them and hold over for the rest, which one is it going to be? That was kind of complex, and I know it's one of those it depends answers. Um, Most guys dial for the first one okay. and hold over. I pick the smallest, hardest target and dial for that one. And make all your holds. And there may be a else. hold over and a hold under in there, but I want to be centered up on that smallest, hardest target. Yeah. And then you're having to do all the, uh, which you should probably do, I'm guessing, ahead of time, the mental math of figuring out where you're going to have to yes. hold over and under. And then that's where you're getting out one of those like quarterback arm armbands mm-hmm. or something, right? Just writing all that down yep. for you. Hmm. Okay, gotcha. That and that it, makes sense because yeah, I mean that's like a lot to keep track of. It. Oh, you can't. You have to have it written down ahead of time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then if you get wind involved when you're trying to hold over, now it gets really complicated. That's what I I, I give you that pro tip. You like you break out the gestural. Oklahoma, twenty mile an hour. <laughs> you're you're holding over. Oh, all right. Now I need to hold two mils left too. That's where that Christmas tree comes in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, we what were about using the, we were using the Venom, what is that guy, the EVR 7C? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wonderful reticle. What were you going to say? I was going to say, what about distances? Like what, what you know, at kind of average distances that a person's going to encounter at, at a match? Between 400 and 700 yards is going to be probably 80% of the match. Okay, gotcha. I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Usually, you know, you'll see these guys shooting 1,000 yards. Well, you might only have two stages out of you know the 20 total that stretch out that far so you know as long as you got 400 to 700 you're going to be fine okay good stuff now one of the things that uh that i know i really wanted to ask you on this one is is regarding so we're talking about preparation you know getting yourself all set up for your your match um, obviously, like you mentioned, you'll gather data, you'll do all kinds of different positional stuff. You'll, you'll kind of get comfortable shooting a lot of different things at your own home range, for mm-hmm. example. Then you actually travel to the match and you're trying to get as much ready for it in advance as you can, but ultimately you're going to get there and the day is going to be however the day is as far as temperature, humidity, I mean, you know, wind, wind you, I mean, nobody can predict wind, all, especially not an entire day of wind. Um, and then you also have the other variables in there, like, well, maybe a stage is going to be set up in a way that you didn't predict it was going to be set up, or an RO is going to want to run something the way you, you weren't really predicting for it to be run. There's a lot of things I feel like you have to kind of improv figure out on the day of. You can't just show up like, 
yep, don't have to do anything. Like, let's just go roll through this thing. Um, what are you doing day of? Like, maybe even all the way to the, the very, very start of your day when you wake up. Like, what are you doing that day of the match? I mean, it, all that stuff is just part of the game. you got to be able to go with the flow. Um, the only things you can make sure you got ahead of time, make sure you got a solid zero, know what your velocity is. You should have already, you know, proofed out your gun a little bit. Um, but that's really all you need, and you can just kind of swag it. Um, you don't know what the stages are until until you get your match book, and even then, sometimes it's really vague, so you don't know what the stage is until you get there. Yeah. Um, you just got to go with it. Um, H- how are you? <laughs> just swag it. Just, just, just swag, swag it. it. Oh, you got to have extra swag. Okay. Hey, you, Jim, write that down. Let's bring some of that. Um, you can get that. It's Old Spice. <laughs> use that, that flavor before. I've been going with the Axe body spray. Ah, no? What's up, middle school? I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I've never used I've never touched the stuff. Uh, you know, speaking of those variables, like you said, like you're going to have, um, you might zero your gun at home under a certain set right. of atmospherics, like, and they're going to be different, you know, when you get to the match, wherever that's at. What are, you, what are like the essential pieces of gear that you have to help you sort those things out when you finally get to your location? A Kestrel. Okay. Um, atmospherics. They don't play a huge part until you get past 700 yards. And, okay. Um, unless you're going from, like, Pennsylvania to New Mexico, where you're going to get a huge swing in elevation, or mm-hmm. it's it's not really going to affect you too much. And a lot of the ballistic solvers and kestrels, they automatically account for all that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I mean, that's not really a big thing anymore. It used to be before we had kestrels and we were just going off paper sheets and stuff like that. You'd want to check the DA before you were going and yeah. have a sheet printed out for that. But with technology now, it's it's not really a problem. Um, and when there's nothing you can do with that, you just that's another one of them swag things, you know. Yep. So I know when we were shooting today, gosh, our range. We're so blessed to have that range, Jim. But the wind is tricky there. <laughs> you look at three flags, they're all doing different things, so then I just end up holding in the middle. I'm like, well, you know, I guess it all evens See out in the happens. end. Then you better have good follow-through and watch that first shot. Hey, that shot happens a lot of the match. You don't know which way to hold. You know, it's just a lazy wind or a headwind. Hold center. Make sure you have good follow-through. Spot your shot. Make a correction. You got, you know, in a 10-round stage, if you burn the first one on a wind call, you got nine more. Yep. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's actually that's a really good tip. Do you even pay attention or try to pay attention to shooters ahead of you with what their wind is doing, yes. or is that? Yes. Yeah. Yep. I mean, it's always kinda... nice to have you know binoculars or a spotting scope and try and watch. It's kind of funny sometimes you'll see a you know big white target, but it's it's got all the impact splatters on the right hand side. It's like, well, there must be a left to right wind, <laughs> 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 or you'll see a big hole dug on the right side, you know, behind the target yeah. where everybody's missing and. Which binos are you uh, are you taking with you in a match? I use the twelve power uh, razor okay. HDs. Yeah, it's good the UHDs. Twelves are good range binos. Mm-hmm. Off a tripod, or are you just hand holding them? Tripod. All right. So your your kit that you're looking around with you. I mean, you've got a a hundred pound rifle, and <laughs> <laughs> you've got you've got a tripod. You've got your it's a lot of stuff. Your razor binos. You've got which uh, also has a spotter mounted right next to it. I got the. 22 power razor with oh. the mill reticle in it because okay. I like knowing how wide my targets are. I'll look at a target and mill it and if it's like four tenths wide well, you know, if I hold in the middle I got two tenths this way and two tenths that way on my wind call. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a good little trick. Yeah. So you're you're doing that. How are you setting, are you getting that, how much time do you have when you actually get to a stage to kind of do all your observations? I was just like going to ask the How many shooters are usually ahead of you? I mean uh, Usually ten guys to a squad. Yeah. Um. And you rotate. So, like, if you went first on this stage, you'll go last on the next one. Okay. It, it rotates through. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um. I don't know. Four, four or five minutes. You know, the RO does a stage brief, reads over the matchbook, and shows you the props, shows you the targets, and you know, you got five minutes maybe till the first guy's up. Once the first guy's up, it's kind of like boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Literally. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Literally. Lots yeah. of booms. Lots of booms. Uh, okay, right on. Four to five minutes. Well, again, that's another thing. Got to be efficient with your gear. If you're trying to look at all those targets and figure out your milling them, writing all your stuff down, making sure your data's all set and you got them all in order and where you're going to hold and whether you're going to dial or hold, that's a lot of stuff you got to figure out in four mm-hmm. to five minutes. I mean, that time flies, I'm sure. Yeah. 
Is there ever downtime where like you finish a stage and you can like go watch another squad on a stage? Not or usually, just kind of I mean, moves through. Every now and then you can get away with that, but usually you just stick with your squad uh-huh. and the whole squad moves to the next stage together. Um, sometimes if you're first up on the next stage, I'll kind of bail out a little bit early and try and watch a couple guys in the next squad before I have to do it. Uh, uh, yeah. How many how many stages, like I mean, general course of fire, like matches it's, it sounds like just talking with like Nick and some other guys, like oftentimes like two days of shooting? Two days of shooting. Uh, usually... 18 to 20 stages for the whole weekend. So it's however they want to break it up. 10 one day, 10 the next day. Do, you know, front load it and do 12 on Saturday and 8 on Sunday so guys can get out a little bit early. Head sure. Mm. Uh, but usually right around 10 stages per day. Yeah. And then rounds per stage on average? Almost all of them are between 8 and 12 rounds. So 8 and 12. Okay. 20 stages, 200 rounds. That's a typical course of fire. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Speaking of rounds, do you recommend uh, loading up more rounds than you're going to need on the stage? Or I'm guessing that's probably stage dependent. Or I always like to have extra. Like if a stage needs eight, I'll just load my ten round mag up. Yeah. Uh, if you have a jam or something, you can just you know throw it. Gotcha. And keep rolling. You know you've got extra in there. Whereas if you've got the right amount and one of them hap- something happens, you know light strike whatever. Uh, where the round doesn't go off, then you're just prepared. I always keep a second mag on me, too. Okay. So if you have a mag jam, something, f- I've seen mags fall and hit the ground, and all the rounds just go kapoof. Uh, just grab your spare mag, throw it in, and keep rolling. So keep on going. That makes sense. One thing, um, you know, at least oftentimes when I think long range precision, you think, oh, prone off a bipod, right? And we're talking about different props and different stages here. And sometimes you want your bipod, but then sometimes you want your bipod for part of the stage, but not all the stage. Uh, I yeah, noticed you, the you had that <laughs> uh, quick release uh, lever on yours that just was like, boom, it's off. Uh, who makes that again? Gray up CNC. By? I've heard of him before. But yeah, I think we know that guy. I make those. <laughs> <laughs> that thing was pretty slick, yeah, though, it's, man. It's that was nice fast. for getting it off when you need it. I never anticipated having a stage where you would, uh, you'd be shooting with a bipod and then be like, ah, screw this bipod. Now I got to go to this PRS barricade and just bipod departs gun. Yeah. Yep. I mean, that was, uh, when you were talking about that, I was, because I was, my whole mind was going to, well, I got to set my rifle up sort of like one way and then it's stuck that way. But no, I mean, just ditch the bipod mid stage. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, I was actually pretty impressed, Jim, even with, you know, the system that you have here. Um, you got that off pretty quick, though. With that I was surprised at how fast it Yeah, it slid it right off, off the front. Yeah. Yeah. It's got that big, giant thumb screw or whatever on the side. It was able mm-hmm. to just kind of... A lot of the chassis now are, are longer. Um, so you could put your bipod out there, and when you fold it up, it doesn't get in the way of your bag mm-hmm. when yeah. you shoot barricades. That was kind of, you know, my rifle set up a little bit different, and I shot that same stage, and I just left it on. And I didn't really... Fine. Oh, yeah, I think you that have it was like a, foreign, yeah, it and like, your bipods like mount sticks it out further. Yeah. Forward. So that that was interesting to where you may or may not have to do that, I guess. Sir, as long as with your pokey bipod feet, you don't just stab your bag on accident. You just send heavy fill all over the place. Nobody likes that. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. For more than one reason. <laughs> um, yeah. How about uh, how about those bags. You've got... Do you just carry one bag with you? I carry... I'm almost ashamed to say it. I carry three. Still could, not as I, bad I, as the one guy we were talking I about. I could get away with bag. one. I could. But I carry three. One for my little mini plate pro. It's like a special thin thin bag okay. that attaches to the plate. So if there's like a run and gun speed thing where I don't want to have to worry about moving the bag, yeah. I can put that on and it just... I just carry the gun and the, the bag. bag attaches to the, the bag plate. goes with it. Ooh. Yep. That plate thing you got is pretty cool. If only pretty we sweet. knew who made them. I know. Anyway. <laughs> and then I carry a uh, Armageddon gear game changer. That's like the full size, you know, do it all bag. I probably use that eighty percent of the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I have a little small solo sack uh, sandbag. Okay. That I use. Is that do you use that mostly as a rear bag then? Mostly as a rear bag, but okay. Yeah. 
And so you'll sometimes use multiple bags at a... Sometimes you need to use two during a stage. Yeah. Um, I'd have to see the actual stage to yeah. know why, but sometimes there's just a good fit. Okay. Are we generally going to be all right having one bag? Yes. I think Nick kind of helps us find. Uh, all right. Make sure it's a full size, like yeah. what what you guys were using. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And learning how to learning how to use a bag is a bit odd. I found. I mean, at least the first few times we use the bag, especially when it's off of barricades. I mean, I've used a rear bag a bazillion times, but but shooting the gun off of a bag and not off of a bipod, like you said, Mark. Usually, you think precision. You just go to bipod immediately. But off those barricades is a little bit fun. I mean, you were going over um, whether you're going to have the bag sort of like draped over something or on mm-hmm. its side or upside down even maybe. Who knows? I know we did that yeah. once off the rooftop. Mm-hmm. You know uh, how it's shaped like bunny ears. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. The bunny ears come down. On like a cattle gate, you can actually, this is weird, but instead of having the bunny ears wrap around because it kind of rounds the top off then, yeah. you can flip the bag upside down and have the bunny ears draped the other way so that it makes kind of like flat. so it gives you a flat top i oh. mean there, there's all kinds of things you can do with when these do bags you ever actually have the bunny ears down do you ever do that oh across a two by four a window i mean okay there's mm-hmm. a pile of different stuff but it seemed like a key theme there whenever you would set your bag up was just increasing surface area and contact yep, yep. so keep that in mind i guess as you're setting the bag up like how where where am i going to get the most contact to have mm-hmm. the most stable surface, I guess. Right. And also don't get sloppy with it, right? Yeah. Like Mark. <laughs> <laughs> I'm right here. You mentioned you mentioned you feel it's worth it to take the extra take second. Take the extra time. Make sure the bag's square. Like the bag only goes, you know, up and down or f- sideways. It's not like on a forty five, you know, some guys will start the stage and it's nice and flat and perfect. And by the time they finish, the bag's just in a jumbled mess and their gun's only resting on one little point of it. Like, that's not doing you any good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Take the extra time, make it flat, settle your gun down into it, make it solid. Helps with keeping your gun level, too, mm-hmm. when it's nice and flat, which does come into play. Mm-hmm. I've now experienced that a couple Especially of times. Especially on that, you know, that 300-yard holdover where you're up four mils in yeah. your reticle. I think that could have been some of your misses. Oh, not having the gun perfectly not leveled. Not being, uh, yeah. You had a lot of well, induced shoot. can't. Yeah, when you're holding up so far high or down low, I mean, that Magnifies little bit it. of can't, yeah, gets magnified. Angles, Mark. Geometry. It's all angles these days. Tangent. <laughs> tangent theta, beta kappa. <laughs> Something like that. It's probably, you rush for them, right? Oh, yeah. Um, Sweet. I'm feeling, I'm feeling a little bit, better about this i guess going into this at first i was very intimidated Mm -hmm. and and dave has now made us feel a little bit better we did ask dave don't get me wrong the the props are all gonna change yeah exactly right i he's got some interesting props like literally they just look for oh that could be really fun to shoot off of like playground stuff you know that kids use and dump trucks and cars and it's just, it's going to be fun. Yeah. I am I am looking forward to it. I, d- I feel like the, the stuff you put us through today, though, did help, did help get, I don't know, it clicked for me in my head just how much mindset comes in to shooting PRS. Everybody who I've ever known who's, like, good at shooting PRS, I always think, like, well, they just have to be just, like, a super good shooter. That's why they're good at PRS. But obviously, shooting comes into it, because they have to hit the targets in order to do it at least decent. Mm-hmm. But now I'm seeing the fact that like a lot of it is just they nerd out over how am I going to shoot off of this thing and how I'd say it's 25 percent skill, 25 percent being prepared before the match, just having your data and your zero and having everything track, and then the other 50 percent is just being in the right state of mind during the match and not making any mistakes. Like it. It takes a lot of mental capacity at the match to keep it all straight. Yeah. Oh, for sure. It's it's taxing remembering, mm-hmm. you know, all the stuff that you have to do to try and, you know, do the do the stage in the right order of operations and this way, that way. And then also, like, obviously, like, safety is paramount. So, like, you want to make sure that you're doing everything there as well. Yeah. There's there's a lot going on. Swagging ain't easy. 
Spike ain't easy, Jim. I think I was lucky enough to not have anybody film that this part of me shooting, but do you remember uh, it was a couple of weeks back when Nick was trying to show us a couple of PRS things ha- when we happened to be out at the range, and he was like, all right, you're going to go from three to four to five to six, and then back to oh. four, five, three, and I think I just shot the 300-yard target just repeatedly over and over <laughs> and over. And then you finished, got it. And finished my magazine, and I was like, I hit like 9 out of 10, felt amazing, and then I looked over at Nick, and his look of disappointment <laughs> immediately <laughs> jarred my memory, and I was like, oh, no, uh, I didn't hit any of the other ones. Uh, yeah, that'll it was, happen. It was bad. We'll, we'll see. Uh, we'll see how this goes. Like you said, Jim, I'm feeling a lot better. Feeling, feeling a lot better, Dave. Appreciate you running us through all those different scenarios, and I think they were. Well, that one was actually pretty complex, but it, it seems like um, you can do like a handful of things that will translate well to a variety of scenarios. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. How about? Let me ask you this thing too. If you can try and remember back to your first PRS style match or anybody else who you've worked with who's shooting at their first one, what do you think is the most important thing that Mark and I can focus on to leave our first PRS match having had fun? Like leaving it being like, that was cool. I enjoyed that. I want to come back. You probably have to like shooting. Well, that that doesn't hurt. Who doesn't like shooting? I mean, who doesn't like hitting? Targets a thousand yards away, and yeah. then having that translate over to hunting, and being able to smoke a whitetail at you know seven eight hundred yards. Never, I, if you don't I, like that, seriously, check your pulse. <laughs> <laughs> but I I do think it's important to to watch good shooters, watch yeah. how they do it. I mean, if if you get in a squad with a bunch of, if I was in a squad with a whole bunch of new guys, I probably wouldn't do as well is what I'd do is if I was in, you know, a super squad. Oh, sure, right? I mean, you just... You're not going to be able to glean as much from a lot of who are around you. Right. Jim and I are going to be doing a lot of gleaning. Hopefully so. So find some people to watch and watch them. I mean, you're going to learn a lot, so... And learning is fun. Mm -hmm. How about, like, when it comes to the shooting, should we just focus on, like, getting hits and if we time out, whatever? Like, yes. should we just be prepared? Like, we're probably going to time out on some, and it is what it is. I mean, some stages are harder than others, obviously. You're not going to time out on all of them, right. but there's some that are meant to be harder, and you're better off just taking your time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, well, and I think, we, I think we touched on this. It was either earlier today or even during the podcast, but you're, you're better off doing it right doing it as correct as you're able to, and then that speed will come over time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and so much of the speed is just is everything you're doing between shooting, I feel like. Mm-hmm. And muscle memory, not having to think about getting in that. I mean, your body just does it. It's yeah. just natural at that point you after you do it bam, so many times. There. Yeah, yeah. You're, not, you're not making like, oh, this little adjustment, or I wiggle here, I put my knee there, just like, boom, got it, mm-hmm. squeeze. Yeah. Cool. Anything else that you would have for somebody where you're just like, hey, you're going to your first PRS match, like, just slip them this a little bit of advice or whatever, anything we didn't cover? Mm, I'd have to think about that one for a minute. But I think the most important thing is just going to a match. I hear a lot of people that are just scared to go. Yeah, or, it's intimidating, or, I think. Or they want to, I'll just go and watch. No, like, bring a gun. You're going to be fine. People are going to help you. Just go to a match. Yeah. You know, just shoot it. You're gonna learn ten times more than you would just watching, you know, internet stuff. Yeah, as long as you're not blatantly unsafe with a firearm or something, you just yeah. generally kind of know the rules or you figure out the rules. Which what's the worst that can happen? You just don't do well. You're gonna have fun. Yeah, like you said, you'll learn a lot for sure, and it'll apply to all kinds of other different types of shooting. Learn and there's club thing. matches. I mean, the club series is huge. I don't want to get into that a whole lot, but you know, you don't have to go to a full blown two day PRS competition. There's lots of oh, okay. one day stuff. There's lots of little twenty two matches around that you know mimic PRS style. So check those out. And yeah, baby steps. 
yeah. the usual. Mark and I aren't doing any of that. We're just full gonna jump in full blown two day, just full yeah. send. Yeah. <laughs> I'm noticing a pattern here. Yeah, hey, let's throw ourselves to the wolves. Okay, yeah, let's do something. You guys are ready, Jim. You love that stuff, though. I do. You love it being chaos. I do because I don't know something in my brain finally clicked, and it was just kind of like screwing stuff up is fun. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah. Uh, yeah, well, sweet. Yeah. yeah, awesome. Thanks for all Dave. the training today, Dave. It was definitely super helpful. Learned, Indeed, learned a lot. Indeed. And if you want to see all that, just don't forget you can go over. It'll be on YouTube. Uh, all the videos from this pod venture will be there. And uh, eventually, we don't know what's going to happen yet because we're recording this prior to uh, shooting the competition. But that also is going to be up that you can watch. <laughs> um, Unless it goes really terribly, in which case I'm going to regret saying this, and you probably shouldn't go to YouTube and shouldn't search Vortex Nation podcast. We can always just cancel the whole thing, Jim. Cancel. <laughs> uh, that's that's a thing nowadays. You're right. So, uh, without further ado, anyway, we will see you guys on the next one. I think really all we have left to do at this point after all these podcasts uh, is to go and shoot the darn thing. So, uh, mm-hmm. we're going to follow up with you after that happens. Good deal. But uh, wouldn't be able to do it, I think, to the level that hopefully we're going to be able to do it without Dave. No, so. absolutely not. And if you have any questions about PRS or other long-range precision or long-range shooting competitions, definitely uh, let us know. Let us know. And also let Dave, you're on Instagram, social media, right? Yeah. D. Preston Shooter. That's my handle name. There so. you go. Easy to remember. Yeah. All right, everybody. Thanks again. We'll catch you on the next one. Shoot straight. Bye, guys. Bye. There you have it, folks. Thank you very much for listening. As usual, give this video a like if you liked it. Comment something below and give us a subscribe to the Vortex Nation podcast channel. It would mean a lot to us. Also, why don't you give us a follow over on Instagram while you're at it, at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'd love to hear from you over there, and we'll keep you updated with all kinds of cool photos and videos from our adventures that we do here. Otherwise, we will see you on the next one. Thank you again. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Have a good one.